Welcome to Mind, Body, Health, and Politics. I'm your host, Dr. Richard Miller. My guest today is Dr. William Courtney, physician, psychiatrist, and authority on medicinal uses of the cannabinoids. Welcome to Mind, Body, Health, and Politics, Dr. Courtney. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. We've heard in recent programs about psychological effects of marijuana. We've heard about uses and abuses of marijuana. Today we'd like to hear from you about the medicinal uses of marijuana with particular reference to the cannabinoids which do not alter the mind but which do provide healing benefits. Can you use that as a takeoff to begin telling us about those cannabinoids? Um, definitely can. Um, the cannabinoids refer to the uh, 20 and 21 carbon molecules. Um, there were 66 until El Soli published an article this year and found another nine, so we're up to 75 cannabinoids, one of which is psychoactive, um, the rest of which, in general, have absolutely no psychoactivity. Um, the let, let, let me get you to repeat that. Of all the cannabinoids that have been identified, one is psychoactive. Um, is that right? Yeah, one class. The uh, tetrahydic cannabinol is actually a class, and there are some variants that have uh, moderate psychoactivity. Um, but the other classes, cannabigerol, cannabichromine, cannabinol, cannabidiol, those are classes within which there are five, six, seven, eight members, um, and those are without psychoactivity. So when people talk on the street and they or in the papers and the media and they use the word marijuana, are they talking about the one that's psychoactive or are they talking about all of them as a class? Um, in this in, in Humboldt and Mendocino, there are probably several thousand people who are well aware um, of the non-psychoactive cannabinoids, and they have been uh, pretty diligent at uh, attempting to locate plants that provide increased amounts of the non-psychoactive cannabinoids. But if you talk about the United States or the balance of California, um, then THC has become tantamount with uh, marijuana or cannabis. Um, and most folks, including the government, have uh, kind of identified THC as the uh, sole or single active property, but um, that clearly is not the case. It's not the case. Um, no, they're the, the other classes, uh, particularly cannabidiol, cannabigerol, cannabichromine, um, those have real significant medical benefits. Um, and in part, a lot of their medical benefits come from the fact that they're not psychoactive. Um, the federal government uh, out of Bethesda had uh, initiated some research that led to a patent uh, that's held by the Department of Health and Human Services of the United States issued in 2003, which was several years before I became involved and interested in, uh, in cannabinoids. And in that patent, they identified CBD or cannabidiol as being a very important element in the plant. And in large part, due to the fact that it's non-psychoactive, allows you to use 100 times more of it than THC. Um, there are some very similarities in the properties between THC and CBD, but a dose, a 10 milligram dose of THC is about all that your average individual can tolerate. Um, a few people with a lot of tolerance may be able to tolerate 20 milligrams, but the, the dose for THC is you know 10 to 20 milligrams, whereas the dose for, say, cannabidiol can be uh, between one and 2,000 milligrams. Um, so the, the non-psychoactives have an um, increasing role to play as we understand that um, they can be used in much uh, larger amounts and can be more effective because of that dosing. Let me clarify something. I, I'm sure a, a high percentage of the people listening have either direct experiment, uh, experience with marijuana uh, through smoking it or possibly eating it, or certainly they have a family member who has. But for those who have little or no experience, please distinguish for them between psychoactive and what is meant by psychoactive marijuana and non-psychoactive marijuana. 
Uh, so the psychoactive is going to have a significant amount of THC or tetrahydrocannabinol in it, um, or THC acid, which with heat, you break the acid off, decarboxylates, then it becomes THC. Um, those concentrations can range from 2 to 28% of the weight um, is THC. And that's the most familiar, and over the last 10 to 20 years, there's been a lot of hybridization to increase the THC content. And for many individuals, um, the THC content is tantamount to the medicinal benefit. And um, a good medicine has a lot of THC, um, and a weak medicine does not. And that sentiment has, you know, has been directly developed and hybridized uh, to produce plants that would support, you know, that assessment of cannabis. Um, but what has come up recently, and then for individuals out there who can locate um, O'Shaughnessy's, which is uh, the Journal of Cannabis and Clinical Practice, generally you can find that at the local health food stores. Um, it, there's a, a lot of research, particularly in the most recent issue, about high CBD strains, the role of CBD or cannabidiol in cancer, um, and in general, an inter interesting thing about that journal um, is it, it will stay on top of these uh, rising high, B high CBD strains and where you can locate them and a lot of the benefits that come from that as kind of a indicator of the, uh, the non-psychoactive cannabinoids that are beginning to surface, you know, in individuals' use as well as in clinical research as well as in basic science research. Are you saying that O'Shaughnessy's, uh, the Journal of Cannabis and Clinical Practice, w uh, helps people locate uh, uh, cannabinoids that affect their body uh, in a healing way but do not alter their consciousness? Exactly. I mean, the lead article was there's a new lab down in uh, Oakland that tests the cannabis that um, many dispensaries provide to patients and they tested cannabis for THC, CBD, and CBN. And when you go into the dispensary to purchase it, um, it'll tell you what the proportions of those three cannabinoids are in that particular medicine. Um, Sounds very complicated. I would think it's complicated to the average person. I mean, if someone's listening to this, Dr. Courtney, and they're saying, you know, I could get interested in this uh, marijuana uh, as a medicinal but I don't want my mind changed. I don't want my mind altered or my consciousness changed. I'd like to take this marijuana the same way that, say, I take penicillin or I take an aspirin, where the medicine has an effect on me, but I don't walk around in a in a different state of mind. Uh, I, you know, how would they approach uh, uh, this uh, this issue? Um, that probably is my area of specialty. Is the uh the non-psychoactive uses, which allow you to use the medicine 24-7. You can use it in the morning, midday, and still function, drive cars. You know, there is no interference with your ability to, to take care of daily issues. I'll bet that's quite surprising to a lot of our listeners, and I think it would be surprising to people around the country to hear that there is a whole special specialty area uh, that you're in, which is marijuana as a medicinal, which which has no uh, altering effect on the consciousness. You know, I guess I've been so close to the subject um, that that strikes me as uh, you know new information. But I I would have to probably agree to you in general that um, because of the association between THC psychoactivity and uh, quality of the medicine that uh, what I do on a day-to-day -day basis probably is is quite uncommon. Oh, I think so. I, 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 I feel very confident that the, 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 the tens of millions or more of dollars that are, that are being spent on marijuana are being spent by people who want to alter their consciousness, very similar to those who are spending you know, this equal amounts or more on alcohol. They're not, they're not, uh, they're not uh, taking the alcohol because of its effect on the cardiovascular system. They're taking it because of the effect on the mental uh, state, right? Well, you know, there definitely is a large portion that looks at THC as being, you know, a recreational effect. But the THC also can distract people from pain that cannot be otherwise managed. Um, and so there's a portion of individuals that the THC 
um, you know, is, is useful for uh, disengaging them from painful situations where what's unusual about this, this new area uh, with doses that are 100 times higher. I mean, a dose for THC is 10 milligrams. For CBD, 1,000 to 2,000 milligrams. Let me stop you there just for a second, because you've mentioned twice now a dose for THC is 10 milligrams. How would a person who's listening to this, who takes their marijuana, let's say first by smoking it, second by eating it, how would they know how many milligrams they're getting? How would they know if, you, if they're smoking it, first of all? How would they know how many milligrams they're getting? The nice thing, the nice thing about inhaled forms, whether it's vaporized or, or combusted, is it, it crosses the, the, uh, the pulmonary field and very quickly goes to the central nervous system and within a very short period of time, the THC has an effect and individuals titrate their smoking behavior by the strength of the cannabis. So if you hear a lot of stuff in, in the literature, maybe the courtroom where they're um, all excited about the fact that THC is so much more potent today. But the individual, as they, if you have 10 different strains with THC ranging from 5% to 28%, um, an individual that smokes occasionally, uh, as soon as they take um, an inhalation, they have a sense of the effect and they will take shorter, shallower, they'll, they'll inhale more ambient air with the smoke to decrease the concentration of a very strong medicine, of a, of a very high THC medicine, um, or they will uh, take very long deep breaths uh, of a uh, medicine that has less THC in order to achieve the same desired effect. So the individual knows what, if, what effect they are comfortable with, and they can reproduce that through smoking behavior and compensate for a very wide range in plant content. Well, what you're saying then is that each patient or each person who uses the marijuana is regulating their own dose by subjective experience. Is that correct? That's correct. Well, doesn't that also mean that if the person gets distracted, for example, and takes a larger puff or forgets that they just took a puff and takes a second puff, that they could then get themselves into a more saturated state, it's almost as if they popped four pills when they meant to take two or three? Yeah, and you generally don't do that. I mean, you if you use pain pills and, and one provides enough relief, um, you rarely take four. That happens more often with eating cannabis. Um, let's wait with that and just stay, uh, we're gonna come to it, thank you very much, but let's stay with the, with the, with the smoking because this issue of titration and dosage is very important, particularly since we heard from Dr. Phil Wolfson, a psychiatrist, two weeks ago, that oversmoking is one of the contributing variables to having a uncomfortable reaction, such as uh, a paranoid reaction to the marijuana, rather than a soothing relaxation uh, uh, reaction. And, and oversmoking with some of the very high can almost occur with the first inhalation. I mean, some of some of the medicines are so strong. In which case, if you inhale and it was like produces either palpitations, raising heart, anxiety, um, you come back to that particular strain and and you won't take a real deep, uh, long breath. You'll just take a small breath and you'll make bring in ambient air to kind of thin it out. And so that first that each strain you, know, you you do have to adjust to. But most folks you know grow one type and they know what it is and they know how to deliver an amount that they can use. But what's That's for people who grow their own. Exactly. But for the customer going out on the street or going to a cannabis club, if they have a license, they might buy one strain that has a certain content at one time and get and adjust to it, as you're saying, but then they might get another strain that has a different uh, percentage uh, uh, of the uh, THC at another time, and so uh, this gets pretty complicated, doesn't it? Well, it is complicated, but once, if you're... Uh, if you're using cannabis regularly, there are just a couple of variables. And the nice thing about if you're going to go to a dispensary and you're looking at, you know, maybe like a harbor site where you've got 20 or 30 strains, you have quite a selection. Um, if this strain says 28% THC and this one says 7%, you have a rough idea what that means. And if you've smoked one or two, you know, you know that, okay, this over here, you know, I'm, I'm not going to need as much. Uh, this one over here. I may need more, but maybe there are there maybe there's a higher CBD content, and 
the CBD um, is an antipsychotic. Um, that's according to El Soli out of the University of Mississippi. He used to, or I mean, it still is connected with NIDA. Um, CBD is anxiolytic, which means it lyses or cuts anxiety as opposed to THC. So as you learn, as we get the information about what is in the cannabis, then you can select um, a medicine that is very stimulating um, and can produce a lot of acceleration, or you can select a medicine that's sedating, that has CBN as the sedative, and then CBD is the anxiolytic and antipsychotic. And so you can, you can kind of select a medicine, and a good dispensary will help you with, you know, you come in, I'm a novice smoker, they're going to they're going to direct you towards the uh, the more mild forms and and they're you know they say you know start very carefully just try a little bit give yourself you know a couple hours to make an assessment no one wants um you know either a customer or a patient to kind of be uh, made uncomfortable or overwhelmed um and then going back to my clients uh, a good 30 40 percent of them um really don't want almost any THC effect. They they just want to get on with their day. They, they have work to do. They have an agenda to follow. But they do want uh, relief from inflammation or swelling or pain. And so they're looking for ways that are pretty much totally non-psychoactive, um, but ones that nonetheless uh, provide them a lot of benefit. So it, would it be correct to say that, that, that these patients that you're talking about are looking for lower or almost non-existent THC content, but higher CBD content? Um, that's a, a simplified... Um, I'm trying to simplify it to make it easy for yes. the listeners, exactly, because this is, a, this is a very complicated area that you're bringing to our attention. And, and this paper that just came out by um, El Soli from the University of Mississippi, um, the previous assessment had indicated there were like 400 different uh, constituents of cannabis. He's now raised that number to 525. As I've mentioned, the uh, cannabinoids were about at 66, and we're now at 75. But the cannabinoids are really just one of the elements that's in cannabis. Other elements that are very important are the terpenes. Um, they have uh, anti-neoplastic, antiviral, antifungal. Um, the flavonoids, which bind directly to the 1A and 2A serotonergic receptors, um, and have an impact on uh, mood disorders and depression. So, and then not only the separate different elements, which you know, Western medicine likes to pick out a single molecule, assess it, and, um, but what's unusual about the plant is the, uh, the, the synergistic effects um, um, of the different constituents and how they work together at lower dosage levels, giving you, you know, probably less side effects, but significant you know, synergistic effects. Um, and so it is a complex field, um, but in general the concept that CBD represents the non-psychoactives, and you can use that um, in a dose that can be uh, 100 to 150 times that that you're using for um, the THC dose, uh, which, like I said, a much smaller amount stimulates the CBD1 receptor to the to the maximum amount that you're comfortable with. Um, wow, you certainly made clear why an expert like yourself is someone that people should be consulting with when they're uh, considering and, and wanting to use this medication. Uh, you're listening uh, to uh, Dr. William Courtney being interviewed on the topic of various cannabinoids uh, as uh, as medicinals. We're here on Mind, Body, Health, and Politics. I'm your host, Dr. Richard Miller. This is KZYX 90.7 FM Philo, KZYZ 91.5 FM Willetson, Ukiah, K201 HR 88.1 FM in Fort Bragg. Dr. Courtney, we hear a lot uh, in the media and in the journals about the importance of antioxidants. And there's research on the antioxidant effects being caused or being the result of use of the cannabinoids in a positive way. Can you speak to that topic? Uh, yeah, we, I kind of raised it a little bit. Yes. The, um, so there's a patent that was issued in 2003 on cannabinoids as antioxidant and neuroprotectants. Um, 
And this uh, document, if you go to leaseofgrass.info, is one of the PDFs there. It's a 20, 30-page document, and I believe that every person that uses cannabis or is considering it, um, you should uh, print out a copy and it, uh, read it you know, several times a day for a couple of weeks. Really? It, it is very, very intense. It explains an antioxidant um, in ways that uh, are better than anything I've ever read in textbooks, uh, you know, pharmaceutical textbooks. Um, it explains, you know, what oxidation is, what oxidative associated diseases. It gives you a list of oxidative associated diseases, which range from cancer and cataracts to um, head trauma, hemorrhagic or embolic uh, cerebral vascular accidents or strokes, heart disease, autoimmune disorders, rheumatoid, diabetes, um, gastric ulcer, uveitis, a, a very extensive list of conditions that an antioxidant can benefit. But what's most unusual about this patent is it gives you a very, very particular dosage schedule. I've, in years of studying this, I've never seen as specific um, and narrow of a dosage schedule. They, they mention uh, dosing that could run from 1 to 40, for example, 5 to 20, and the phrase is, and in particular, 20 milligrams per kilogram body weight. Um, and it compares the patent, compares uh, cannabidiol, which is essentially a, a fat molecule. It's, it's uh, a fatty acid, or no, well, TA, CBDA is a fatty acid. CBD, you take the acid off. But it's primarily a fat molecule that has um, a couple of hydroxyl groups which allow it to be soluble enough that it can get into the bloodstream. But because of its 20 carbon backbone, it's lipid enough that it can cross the blood-brain barrier. Um, and if you look at the other antioxidants that CBD is compared with in that patent, it compares to vitamin C, vitamin E. If you look at ascorbic acid, you've got one, two, three, four, five, six. You have six different oxygen molecules, which makes it a water-soluble vitamin. And, the, um, and the, a water-soluble constituent will get into the serum, but it's, not, it's going to have great difficulty crossing membranes and blood-brain barriers um, because of all that, because of that highly polar nature. And what the patent points out is that CBD is, is quite unique because it's a fat or fatty or lipid-based antioxidant, which allows it to get into areas um, where oxidation or the, uh, you know, the, the burning of sugars at the mitochondria within the cells to cross the blood-brain barrier where it can be effective with Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, head trauma. Um, you, know, you can read, Every time you read this patent, uh, additional information uh, comes from it that is really quite remarkable. The, uh, the article, by the way, that Dr. Courtney is talking about is uh, one of many articles that he references uh, on a website called Leaves of Grass. You can find it. Just go to Google and type in Leaves of Grass. Uh, the subtitle is Medical Marijuana Information from Dr. William Courtney. Um, when patients come to you and uh, you are going to prescribe uh, non-mind-altering marijuana, uh, what form do they take it in and where do they get it? Well, we don't actually prescribe cannabis. Um, you can recommend it for someone who's never used it, possibly 90% of, 99% of my patient context, it's an approval I'm approving of someone who is already using it but would like to not have to suffer legal consequences from the using it. So, but what they, what they often come for, or a lot of my middle-aged and older patients, is um, they may have enjoyed THC when they were in their 20s. Um, a lot of them uh, stopped smoking when they were raising their family. And now in their 40s and 50s, uh, football injuries and logging and fishing, and there's articular problems and disc problems, back pain. Um, they're interested in the anti-inflammatory and the analgesic properties, but not the um, daytime euphoric aspects. But they want the anti-inflammatory particularly, don't they? Um, it is. They're, that's probably cannabis. If you're going to look for a single concept, um, one of its strongest suits is in its ability to provide uh, anti-inflammatory actions. There are five or six cannabinoids that I know of, and ten terpenes that are anti-inflammatory. And what no one has assessed is 
what happens when you, when you mix all of these different ways of altering the uh, inflammatory system? You know, what's the compilation of the synergistic outcome? But in field, you see that in um, people that are using the raw green leaf, which the way it comes on the plant, the large shade leaf is not psychoactive. If you get to the smaller leaves near the apical mare stem, near the end of the end of the, of the branch, those can be significantly psychoactive, but the large, the very large leaves at the bottom are not psychoactive unless you heat them. Um, in India, they uh, heat them for about 10 minutes uh, and then grind them up in a mortar and pestle and turn them into little tiny, like half-inch balls of leaf material. One is mild, two is moderate, three is markedly psychoactive. So you can convert the leaf into something that's psychoactive, but my patients are uh, avoiding the heat, which decarboxylates THC acid, releasing the THC. Um, and for several years, I, would, I was recommending drying the leaf, but when you did that, you um, and you ground the dried leaf, you would lose a lot of the terpenes, which have a lot of anti-inflammatory and other properties that are quite beneficial. And so, it, over the, the years, terpenes and the flavonoids produce the anti-inflammatory effect. Um, there are ten terpenes, I believe, that are have distinct terpenes that have anti-inflammatory properties, and five to six cannabinoids. And this is all. I mean, this is what we know today. You know. Every, yes. It's how much is actually going on in the plant uh, will continue to uh, grow as as our studies you know, provide yes. information. Well, let's take a hypothetical case: a, a seventy year old man with uh, with with osteoarthritis, uh, you know, inflammatory uh, condition uh, of bone joints, comes to you. Uh, this person does not. Uh, uh, cultivate marijuana, doesn't smoke marijuana, but has heard this program and wants to use marijuana uh, strictly as an anti-inflammatory and does not want any mind-altering effects. Uh, what happens? Um, fortunately for people that live in this county, if you don't grow, um, your, your neighbor may. Um, and you most likely know someone that does. And if you um, if you can trust them, and, and that's a really it's a bigger issue than it may seem, um, a person that is growing either out, outdoors is less likely to use um, sprays because you don't have the same uh, environmental conditions that you do indoors. But if you want leaf year-round, and that definitely is something that I would think you would want to consider if you're going to um, – the indoor grower goes through several phases where there's a lot of those large uh, water leaf or guard leaves that are removed, and composting is a big issue. How do you get rid of all that leaf material? Um, it, so that you know. So this 70-year-old man is now looking for a friend or a neighbor who has an excess or some of these large leaves that they've grown indoors. In other words, a 70-year-old man, this patient. He's not, he's not going to your local uh, medical marijuana dispensary, for example. Is that correct? And well, saying not, I, I need I need non psychoactive marijuana that Dr. Courtney said would be would help my uh, my inflammation here. It's um, there. Dispensaries are beginning to look at this. I've been talking with enough of them, and I'm working with one up in Humboldt, in Arcata, right now, who is putting in a very large greenhouse just for the production of leaf. Um, does juicing is going to provide juice is going to provide juicers um, hired a nutritionalist who's keeping track of different conditions and patients trying to follow its effects so I hope you know in the near future that dispensaries will look at that as yet another service that their um, patients could could use but I mean first they have to come across the information they've got to test it try it get some feedback and then when they do then becomes okay what you know uh, we need a source of leaf we need a refrigerator um, and so I, I I hope you know that there'll be that it'll be a lot easier and then in the coming years to to go into a dispensary pick up a bag of leaf like you would spinach and uh, and then take it home and be able to put it in smoothies and pesto and juice and, and know what the content is because as you said before it, with the with the psychoactive material 10 milligrams is a sufficient dose but when it comes to the non psychoactive medicinals you could take a hundred or even 200 milligrams but you need to be able to quantify or and somebody needs to quantify so that you can 
ask for that amount, right, and say, hey, this is what I'd like to take on a daily basis. How many of these little bags should I be purchasing? Yeah, and actually the dose of the non-psychoactive is not 100 or 200 milligrams. It's 1,000 to 2,000 milligrams. 1,000 to 2,000, so somebody has to be measuring. So we've got science ahead of us. Let me interrupt us to take this phone call, Dr. Courtney. Okay. Welcome to Mind, Body, Health, and Politics. You're on the air. Good morning, doctors. Good morning. How are you today? Quite well, thank you. This is really informative and fascinating, and uh, I hate to uh, sort of crash the party by bringing up something that is imminently uh, threatening to all of us, which is the vaccination uh, for the so-called swine flu that they are, the WHO, is mandating for everybody all over the planet. So I was going to ask Dr. Courtney, will the cannabis do anything to help us uh, either uh, survive the vaccination or uh, organize to stop the vaccination? Thank you. Very interesting question. Dr. Courtney, what do you think of that? Um, there are definitely multiple properties in the terpenes and the cannabinoids in the plant that are um, antibacterial, there are some antiviral, there are definitely some anti-inflammatories. It mimics the body's endogenous cannabinoid system, which is the system, one of the systems in cellular physiology that regulates cell function in terms of every cell has a particular activity. If it's overactive, um, the cell wants to downregulate it to a normal function. If it's underactive, it wants to upregulate it to keep it in a normal bandwidth. So the body modulates cell function using the endogenous cannabinoids. Cannabis, through its cannabinoids and terpenes, facilitates rapid return to normal function if, if it gets out of line. So w with something like swine flu, um, first there's going to be the viral infection, and obviously an antiviral would be helpful there. If that's insufficient and you develop a virus, then what often happens is you have a secondary bacterial infection that turns into a pneumonia that is more likely to be the fatal outcome uh, in this situation. So an, an antibiotic present could help in the very early phases to uh, prevent a condition from becoming even clinical. There was an interesting study out of uh, Icarus in 2000, I think in seven in Canada, where it showed that the body stored these fat-soluble messenger molecules, the cannabinoids, as it stores the fat-soluble vitamins A, D, E, and K in the fat tissue because that's where that's where they're comfortable and they're located. But the study showed that the body was able to um, draw down a specific cannabinoid to meet the demands of a particular situation. If the body had, you know, 77 of these cannabinoids stored in fat tissue, um, and there were antifungal, antibiotic, you know, um, antineoplastic, if these various functions were stored there and a situation arose and the body could selectively draw them down and use them in the very early stages, way before the situation became clinically detectable, um, that would be the uh, ideal uh, situation in terms of health maintenance and prevention of, of illness. Yeah, suppose somebody hears you talking now and they say, she was here, uh, I'm hearing that uh, there are endogenous uh, cannabinoids from this doctor, that means cannabinoids that my body produces is there anything, and, and these endogenous cannabinoids that I produce myself actually are anti-inflammatories. Uh, uh, is there anything I can do to increase my own internal production of uh, these endogenous cannabinoids? Do we, is there any, do we yeah, the, the, um, the body, one of the nutrients that we eat is arachidonic acid, which is an omega-6 essential fatty acid, meaning that I don't think any mammal can produce arachidonic acid. Arachidonic acid is a, is a simple fatty acid that's stored in the membrane of every cell of the body. And from arachidonic acid, uh, the body synthesizes three broad classes of very important molecules. It synthesizes all of the prostaglandins, synthesizes all of the leukotrienes, which are involved in inflammatory and immune response, and synthesizes all of the endogenous cannabinoids. So. You then the next question would be, well, how do I know if I've got enough uh, arachidonic, arachidonic acid? Arachidonic acid, right. Well, that's why we have to refer you back to Richard Miller, who understands the practicalities. <laughs> uh, we, know it's, we know it's an essential fatty acid. Brings us back to exercise, doesn't it? Exactly. <laughs> exercise is a wonderful place to be in. <laughs> well, you heard it, folks. 
You heard it from Dr. Courtney. It's another commercial for exercise. We're going to take another call here, Dr. Courtney. Okay. Welcome to Mind, Body, Health, and Politics. You're on the air. Yes, hi. I would like to ask about the uh, effects of marijuana on ADD uh, in relation to the uh, racing brain syndrome and how I could find information about that. Great question. Could you hear him, Dr. Courtney? Yes, I could. Good. There's um, a magazine called Treating Yourself Out of Canada, which is, of all of the uh, cannabis magazines, it, it, um, it, it tries to emphasize the medicinal aspects. I mean, there are certainly plenty of pictures of uh, people in bathing suits and and, and the four color pictures of colas and stuff, but they really there's they make an extra effort to reinforce uh, medical properties and and kind of educate their readers, and they had a, a big review on um, uh, ADHD and ADD. Um, and there's uh, a lot of information there where we don't quite know how it all comes together. I mean, we we know that CBD is. Um, is an anxiolytic. It's also an antipsychotic at one level. Um, and so if you, and it's also an antidepressant, um, so it interfaces in probably the serotonergic system. If, if, and individuals particularly that use cannabis for psychiatric issues can be quite intuitive and are able to, to state that this strain provides me a lot of benefit and that this one makes me really anxious and paranoid and I don't like it at all. Um, I remember having a, a patient, an adolescent, who um, had been using um, trim leaf and found benefit from that. And then uh, when his mother was able to grow enough bud that she could allow her child to use that, she said, you know, here, have, have the good medicine. And, and the son said, I, you know, I don't want the good medicine. I want the leaf. And she said, no, no, we've been using the leaf because that's all we could afford. But now we can afford the good medicine, which, you know, like I said, is tantamount to high THC. And and this individual was, you know, I, I really I don't want the good medicine. I want the bad medicine. <laughs> and and you look at the difference between the leaf and the bud, and, and one's going to be you know, going to produce, uh, you know, kind of racing mind palpitations and you know, anxiogenic, uh, increasing anxiety, whereas the the leaf product is going to be anxiolytic and calming, and uh, the individual knew right away that you know you know I don't I don't want that part of the plant I want this part. It sounds it sounds intimidating to a certain extent, and it sort of reminds me though of exactly what's going on with prescription medicine in the SSRIs, which I'm sure you're aware of, namely that many patients have to take. At first, they, t they might take Wellbutrin, and then they might try Effexor, and then they might try Seroquel, and then they might try Paxil, and then they might try uh, Luvox, until they find one that sort of matches, and yet it's an excruciating, a very excruciating protocol and procedure uh, that they go through. And in a way, you're talking about something similar, which says to me, you know, we're, this is the beginning of a new era. It's the beginning of a new era with regard to understanding the cannabinoids and how they can be used medicinally, just like it's the beginning of a new era with regard to what we call prescription medicine uh, antidepressants. And those of us who are, who are in this kind of beginning transitionary stage are going to be, we're going to pay a price. There's going to be a lot of inconvenience, if not worse. Uh, it's sort of like, you know, where the car was better than the horse, but a lot of cars broke down for many years until we got them pretty well reliable. It's a complicated situation. Let me take another call here, please. Okay, and, and, but one point on that, if you go yes. to that leaves of grass. The oh, first, good. The first two documents are the International Cannabinoid Research Society abstract, each about 140 papers, very informative as to the basic science going on, and if you look at who's sponsoring the research, it's Merck, Abbott Labs, Bristol Myers Squibb. So the major global pharmaceuticals are moving in yes. and funding the research and knowing that this really is a low side effect solution to a lot of the problems that they currently are dealing with medicines that, you know, um, have as much of a side effect as a primary effect. Yeah, there's no question marijuana is moving into the mainstream around the country. Uh, do we have the person on the air? Yes, Welcome I'm to here. Mind Body Health. You're on the air. Greetings, doctors. Thank you for your good work, Dr. Courtney. Uh, you. Could you please briefly discuss 
this debate between indoor and outdoor and why the legalization, the pot clubs are pushing the indoor when most of us know that the true way to grow this plant organically is outdoor and it's very difficult to not use chemicals indoor and they don't understand using a chemical pot for sick people. Thank you. Dr. Courtney, if you will, uh, you know, we've got two minutes left, and uh, I don't want to get into the politics of indoor and outdoor unless you want to comment on how uh, each of them affects the medicinal use of the non-psychoactive uh, cannabinoids. Yeah, we really haven't had a chance to really talk about juicing. No. And, and that is something that is very dear to my heart in terms of, but it, the nice thing about indoor is it allows us access to leaf on a year-round basis as long as they're not using chemicals. I think, uh, you know, if we were, if I was to talk to someone down in Salinas who is interested in, in producing plants and putting it in plastic bags and, you know, making it available widely, obviously I would prefer an outdoor plant, um, but around in the northern environment, um, it's hard to have fresh green leaf on a year-round basis without going indoors. We're trying to de develop some techniques that are low wattage, which would use LEDs and it would rapidly cycle so that you essentially would be, be, be bringing plants through every two weeks, which would allow a large production of leaf. And then if you move into the high CBD plants, you would actually be producing bud that you could make keef from, and that keef could be used topically. Topical keef is excellent for arthritis, so we didn't quite get back to that, but it produced, you can get a very high local effect, and you can even use the THC without becoming psychoactive for particular joints and fingers. And so there's the topical uh, use of the bud is useful. The bud could also be used in yogurt at bedtime for sleep without the psychoactivity interfering with your daytime activities. And then the, the raw green leaf is really, I think, will become a dietary essential. I mean, it's, it's a leafy green vegetable um, that for 34 million years has been evolving and has developed a, a very strong niche of helping the body's immune system function more effectively by relying on the exact same mechanisms. I mean, there are there are terpenes that bind at um, allosteric or secondary sites that alter the binding affinity of the receptor for the primary cannabinoid like CBD. So you have multiple molecules impacting the receptors in the immune system. I mean, this is, is such an inter, interwoven system. And a complicated system. We've got, you know, just 30 seconds. I want to ask one last question in 30 seconds, please. And that is when people go to a medical, medical marijuana dispensary, can they be? Can they find out the content of the of what they're eating when they get a cookie or a brownie or a drink? Can they find out the content yet, or is that something we have to uh, do in the future? It's coming along. There's a. It's coming along. The fellow down in um, down in Guadalala, all of his ingredients are there, and he's trying to get Steep Hill, which is the analytic lab, to um, assess the THC, CBD, and CBN. And so you'd be able to pick up this cookie and you go... I know what the quantification is. And, and that, that it's consistent, yeah. you know, that, that every cookie is going to have the same amount rather than kind of homemade and yes. very widely. Dr. Courtney, I want to thank you. It's been extremely informative. I think the takeaway for today is that there's a tremendous difference between lighting up, having a smoke to alter one's consciousness for recreational use and using marijuana as a medicinal where you go to a doctor like Dr. Courtney and you get very specific recommendations and then he's got to help you actually find the medicine because you can't buy it in your local store.